Hello, you are listening to Radio Maria, and this is Just Life. And I'm delighted to welcome today uh, Catherine Bennett um, in the studio with us for the, the the first time. Catherine, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. And uh, and Catherine, um, just uh, rather refreshingly, when she uh, sent over an email to me to to say this is a little bit about myself for information, described herself as mum, stepmum, daughter, and wife. And I say refreshingly because uh, there's great reluctance to define ourselves by our relations. Um, I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment, which might chat about a bit later as we speak, the, the rise and triumph of the, of the modern self and speaks about this expressive individualism where we sort of resist being defined in relation to others. So that was refreshing to, uh, to hear that. Um, and then Catherine's also been a teacher for 25 years and is now a <clears throat> writer and a podcaster. Um, you can find her um, on Choose Agape and also Catholic Unscripted. Um, but I want to, to start with a, another detail about you on which everything rests. Um, just yesterday on a program, The Friar Side, I was speaking about giving thanks for the, the sheer goodness of existence, the, the very amazing fact of our being being the, the, the first thing to give thanks for. And, and as you said, that you know, you uh, more than most have have reason to be thankful for for your for your being. Yeah, so that's a that's exactly right. And and on our way dashing through South London traffic, I pray with my children. We try to pray the rosary, but if if failing that, we just give a prayer of thanks for our lives, for the day, for the gifts that we've been given. And I always remember that that the children are not mine. I prepare them to return them to our Lord. So every every child is a gift, a treasured gift for us to look after. And and you spoke about the beginning of my life, um, it, my life that almost wasn't. So my mum was late marrying. I think she she was the eldest of seven, would have been one of nine or ten, but but Granny lost a number of children. This was back in the thirties, the early thirties, and um, she met my dad when she was in her late 30s and and married late and found herself pregnant in her 40s which in the 70s was quite unusual it's not so much today but she was considered a very old mum and then she came in contact with german measles and the doctors at the time along with other friends suggested she terminate the pregnancy because uh, she was told that there's a high chance i would be severely disabled and she said to me she could she, she did think about it so she said I have to be honest I, I thought about it I was frightened and I didn't think that I would be able to cope but her Catholic faith you know really was her, her faith in God her belief that God would give her the strength to cope whatever the outcome and that she knew that she had to keep keep me um, meant that she she made the decision to choose life she chose to have me and here I am um, and was thanks be to God fine uh, she'd had a very very premature baby before me she'd had miscarriages and then had me a healthy on time quite a big lump actually I think uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I think I was about nine pounds which is which is quite big but not as big as the almost 12 pounds babies I had myself <laughs> that's another story oh wow so, yeah, yeah <laughs> big babies um so I, I, I almost wasn't, but for my mum's faith. And in a way, telling the story sounds as if a woman was pregnant, she was a Catholic, she knew everything would be fine, and she had the baby, but it was ne it was never like that. She was absolutely terrified. She, she didn't think she'd be able to cope. She she knew it would be easy just to, just to uh, end the pregnancy. And it was really a very, very dif difficult time of discernment. And uh, she just knew that this was the right thing to do. And whatever whatever came, she would be given the strength to to cope with. And so I was born into, I was uh, so so I think I I knew love from from really from the beginning. I felt loved right from the beginning and and, and wanted, which is huge, I think. And and unfortunately, some young people today just don't don't experience that. That's fascinating because two two things in, in common there straight away. I I was a nine pounder, um, hey. <laughs> although although I went went on getting substantially bigger than you than, than you got, um, and uh, and my mum was forty one when she when she had me, 
Um, but just to, sort of speaking about um, you know, your your mum being sort of you know in, encouraged to to think about termination um, has me think about sort of choice and contemporary society and sort of choice is lauded as this as this great good and this really important thing to give people as many choices as as possible but it's not that great when it makes um it much easier to do the to do the to do the wrong thing um when it makes it easy to to do the the wrong thing and 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 much much harder to to do the to do the right thing so thanks be to god you know your mother you know chose chose love and is is that some of the the inspiration behind your uh, the title for, for where you sort of write and uh, and podcast with Choose Agape? Yeah, I suppose so. It's tr- it's very true about choice because it, it's it's about freedom, isn't it? And what do we have freedom for? And we don't have freedom just to do anything that we can. Um, it's the same we see in in science and technology. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. And we see the disastrous results of of those who believe just because you can, you do. And um, Choose Agape really came about because um, I think it was lockdown. So firstly, we were going a bit stir crazy. And <laughs> uh, and I, I was familiar, as we all are, with this slogan. I think it was Catherine Hamnett, very similar to my own Catherine Bennett. Uh, and she had a um, slogan, a T-shirt slogan in the 80s, was it? I don't know, 90s, uh, saying choose love or choose life maybe it was both um choose life i think it was and and wham and um what's his name george michael wore it and it was big and she famously said if you want to get a if you want to get something out there print it in big letters and put it on a t-shirt and that was her message and i thought well if we want to get anything out there what is it it's christ and holy mother church that's what we need to be spreading is 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 the gospel and so I thought about the slogan, choose love, and I thought love is such a misunderstood word, you know, um, and actually when we hear now, love is love, do what you want, um, it just shows, it just reveals how little we really know what it means to love. And so I thought if I, if I use the, if I use that slogan, steal it, and then change it to choose agape, then that might, that might get people thinking, what does that mean? (laughs) Yeah. Well, choose life, I think, first came on my, uh, radar um show my era because of the film train spotting oh gosh with yeah. <laughs> uh with that sort of uh speech in it sort of uh cho- choose life yeah um begins which actually for a film um and then a, a, i've read the book and the book's pretty horrible mm. and i wouldn't recommend anybody reading reading the book but for a sort of fairly depraved book and and film there's actually quite something something in that in that speech and and mm. and in fact in the in 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 the in the bible you know we hear those lines about sort of choose, choose life mm. and it is something that we we have to to keep on doing like we have we have choices in this life which lead to to death and uh, and choices which lead to to life and ultimately the greatest choice we can make is is for Christ the the one who gives us um life life in a in abundance um but yeah. it's it's interesting what you say about we do live in an era of of slogans, and uh, and I hate I hate that fact. Like mm. it really, really, really annoys me. But as as Christians attempting to transform the culture, we have to respond to the the culture that we're in. And if and if people are sort of brought into movement by slogans, then we need to we need to get get good slogans. Yeah, I. I think that's probably right. I, I have a similar aversion. In fact, it, I'm starting to wonder: are we are we the same age? Because we seem to have the same references. Um, uh, the the train spotting was something I watched. I would have been in my late teens, probably, um, maybe early twenties. I can't remember. But it's interesting you mentioned that because it was awful, really depraved. And I remember at the time there was it was all over Newsnight. I think Jeremy Paxman did something about it, and um, columnists were writing about it, and everyone said it's terrible. You can't let your children see this. I was older than than uh, you know some of the younger kids who might have gone um it was awful but you talk about that little moment of of choose life there's something in that and i think it's a bit it reminds me of these flannery o'connor stories where these moments of grace penetrate the mm. darkness and we talked just recently on our catholic unscripted where i discuss um, issues of faith and, and culture with gavin ashington and mark lambert each week and 
we talked about Russell Brand's hints towards Christianity and we know about his his past. He's been very clear about it. And, and then we've heard about Shia LaBeouf and his coming to the Catholic faith. And we also know the, the, the story of his past, both very dark and, you know, you talk about choice. Two people who, um, by their own admission, did whatever they could and with money it opened up many more doors than, than to the ordinary person. And they lived lives of, of sexual depravity and uh, drug taking, all the rest of it that's all documented. And here they are. I think I think there's something to be said for, for, you know, things get so dark and we are so lost and we are so broken. And it goes back to Augustine's uh, hearts are, you created us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Mm. And I think we're just longing for that rest and we try to find it in so many places and we don't find it. And Sometimes we have to get really fall on our knees before, before we God breaks through, before grace penetrates in that way. So in a way, I I quite like uh, some quite dark films, you might say, and, mm. and and books, as you said. Although one wouldn't want to encourage <laughs> certainly not kids to be to be reading, but but uh, it does it does open up the possibility of light. I suppose that's it. Um, yeah, and the slogans. I, I agree, but what's interesting is I've got, you, you mentioned I'm a stepmom. I'm a stepmom to a 26 year old daughter, Emily, who's fantastic, who grew up uh, not in the faith um, and is becoming a Catholic and being received into the church at Easter, oh, uh, which is really, really wonderful and completely an answer to prayer. Uh, all we did is, is try to witness. We never pressured. We always said, come to church if you'd like to. And sometimes she did and sometimes she didn't. And, uh, she was telling me about being at the gym and she's, you know, of this generation. And she said she was chatting to someone and saying, oh, what, you know, why are you doing this? Oh, to get fit. Or well, why do you want to get fit? I don't know. You want to look good. Why do you want to look good? And she was pushing them with questions. And at one point, I think she asked, well, why, what, what's the purpose of you existing anyway? And there was a couple of young people her age in their mid twenties. And they, they, they both looked dumbstruck, completely dumbstruck, mouths agape and said, no one's ever asked us that. We've mm. never thought about it. My goodness, you're such a deep thinker. And she said it was quite amusing because it wasn't really that big a question. It's a very basic question. And yet they'd got to their mid-20s and nobody had ever asked them. They'd never considered what their purpose is, why they're here. And so, yes, we don't really like empty or shallow slogans and things. But if if sometimes if those are the things that will catch those young people who've never been asked, what's it all for? Why are you here? And then draw them in a bit like a net, you know, that, that fishing net of mm. the to out into the deep and then try and draw them in, then then it may be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And you sort of describe there like the the Socratic sort of method of, you know, following up a question with yeah. a question and trying to probe to to what lies beneath and, and I think that's that's so essential, sort of Alistair McIntyre uh, I think who's become increasingly important. Um in, in in my in my thinking sort of he asked the question about why so few of our of our moral discussions get anywhere mm. um why do they just sort of throw so much more um heat than light and uh, and one of the things that he says is that we just have incommensurable world views and when we're using um words um they simply don't mean the same thing to to me as they as they do say to the atheists that are that I'm talking to and and so it's really important to ask questions to try and understand what the other person thinks it's also just really important on a human level because it makes me look like I'm interested in you mm. like I genuinely desire to know you and to know and to know what motivates you as opposed to telling you what should motivate you to actually probe and start to find out well, well what what does excite you Mm. And and there's that long tradition, which is the re the reason that we do anything when you get to the root of it is to be happy. And I, I completely agree. I don't think our our culture in the main tends to to deal with any big questions about about what happiness might might mean, other than doing whatever you want in any any given moment. And and I think people realize when they re reflect on that that there's a there's an emptiness um in that and you can take that i i sometimes do with school kids when they speak about sort of freedom and happiness they say so is the drug addict who has easy access to drugs 
and as much money as he wants um is he is he free and mm. where their definitions have led them they 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 would say yes but they know in their heart of hearts that the the drug addict is is not free and i think we we live in a society where addiction is just more and more um prevalent and and technology has made that made that that possible and uh and so you know we have a a real real freedom to 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 offer um mm. on you you mentioned about a- ages i'm i've been brought up far too well to ask you how old you are but i <laughs> I, I, I will simply say that i'm for, i'm 43 and born in 1980 and you can say whether you're close i'm older <laughs> older well, there you go i'm 47 and born in 76 Okay, well, given Catherine's here in the studio with us. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll recommend her moisturizer because because I was I, I, I was never never going to get that. Well, the, but the only clue that might have uh, given that to me was that you were a teacher for for twenty five years, um, yes. which is far longer than you you look, and you've not not got nearly enough crease lines for somebody who taught for twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was just reversed since I've since I've left teaching. No, no, no. Teaching's wonderful. I love I love teaching and I love the young people. They're fantastic. But I've I've moved along uh, and doing other things now. Yeah. yeah. And um when I was I was listening to one of your uh, um talks with um Mark Lambert and, mm-hmm. and Gavin Ashenden, you were uh, speaking about your about your your families and um sort of in a in a, in a culture which largely thinks that sort of christianity is a is a switching off of the of the intellect and that when you start to ask questions that's when you you leave the the faith speaking about in your families being able to to have real meaningful discussions that that engage the 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 intellect but you said that you didn't really have that as a child there was a, a beautiful piety but not so much of the intellectual side how how did that come up come about who inspired you what did you you read and how did that that journey begin yeah so it's true i had a i had a, a lovely um young childhood a very happy one and uh mum was a, a devout holy woman she really was and we i mean we used to go to mass every morning and in the holidays and pray the rosary after morning mass. You can imagine how much I loved that as a 10 and 11 year old. <laughs> it was all the old women of, of the parish. Um, <laughs> I'd be r- rattling through my Hail Marys, Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with you, bless her. Um, and, and just, it was just, you know, it was just like air and water. That's just what we did. Uh, and funnily enough, my dad, who wasn't a Catholic, but became one when my brother lived unexpectedly and was baptised. My dad was baptised along along with him. So... So yeah, faith faith was wonderful, but it was it, it just was. It's just as I said, it's just permeates everything. Um we'd have house masses, we'd have the holy water font, praying the rosary, evening prayers, family prayers. But when I got to so a couple of things happened when I when I then entered my teenage years, I went to a school which I hated. I didn't like at all. I was very unhappy there. <laughs> and this coincided with with uh, my mum becoming very ill. She'd always been somewhat ill. Uh, but she became very unwell with cancer. And uh, then uh, I started hearing um, some very prominent atheists at the time who, who were coming out, uh, Dawkins, Dennett, Harris, Harris later, really, some of them later, but early on I was I was hearing some some voices of atheism in the culture and also becoming more popular Um you know, public profiles of people who were who were who seemed to me to be so clever, so erudite. You know, then Christopher Hitchens came along, and I was really wowed by him. And what's interesting, I was, I was reflecting on this. I think just recently, because I'm trying to to complete something on on uh, femininity, which is a big thing I'm I'm very interested in is this lost femininity. And I think I wanted to be. Um, how can I say, I suppose I wanted to reject my own femininity and take on what I would say is maybe a more masculine um, approach. And that, that it wasn't as simple as, you know, putting on trousers and getting my hair cut. It's, it's just I saw in these men, uh, and it was mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly men, they were really clever, they had lots of answers, they were really confident as well. And so... When I went to ask my mum, uh, 
she she didn't really have many answers because she just loved Jesus. <laughs> mm. She just I just love Jesus. I'm just looking after the family and I love God and and it was lovely. But I thought, well, why things that started to knock me? I said, why can't women be priests and and why um, latterly why can't uh, gay couples be married? And um, there wasn't really any anything coming back and. So all of this, no adequate answers as I as I felt, and coupled with mum's sickness and what was going on in the culture, and then her eventual uh, death, I I just completely turned my back on my faith. I mean, really completely. I, I was absolutely done done with it. Mm. So, but this was over a period of years. Probably by the time I was twenty, twenty one, twenty two, I was I was done. That was it. All right. Well, let's um. We can go to a, a piece of music now and listen to uh, the Kyrie from the the Misa Criola song by um, uh, a fellow Catherine, um, Catherine Jenkins. Um, and then after that music, uh, perhaps we can sort of pick up on uh, how you, how you came back to the to the faith, and then um, and then discuss your sort of thoughts on uh, on on femininity and uh, and masculinity and what that might mean in our uh, contemporary culture. Hello, you are listening to Radio Maria, and this is Just Life, and I'm delighted to be joined in the studio today by uh, Catherine Bennett. We were listening there to uh, the Kyrie by uh, Catherine Jenkins from the uh, Missa Criola. Um, my mum tells me I should play more Andrea Bocelli, but I didn't say it there, but I know she's a <laughs> Catherine Jenkins fan too, so so I've done okay in case she's, in case she's listening. Um, Catherine, you were telling us um, just before we went to the, the Kyrie there about... Um, Around sort of age 20, 20, 21 and various things going on in your in your life, and uh, the sort of the new atheists appearing on the on the scene. These men who you know appeared, um, say appeared very intelligent, or I think in fact they are very <laughs> very intelligent, um, just uh, not wise. Yes, um, and uh, I'm, I'm feeling like you were done done with your faith, and yet <clears throat> here you are now in a Radio Maria studio and writing and. Uh, Plugging on choose, choose agape. Yeah, it's quite a turnaround, isn't it? Only with God's help. Um, it's interesting you say that about about cleverness because, of course, all of those men were intelligent. Alice von Hildebrand, uh, who, if you don't know, definitely worth mm. worth finding out about Alice von Hildebrand, who who wrote um, about femininity and somebody I I is inspired inspired me quite a lot. She. She talks about Simone de Beauvoir, clearly a very intelligent woman, mm. very intelligent. But <clears throat> she said, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, that intelligence is, you know, can can be dangerous. So it's not about some, you know, we're, we're cleverer than others, but it's that lack of wisdom, as you say. Uh, so then um, to take a very long story and, and try and um, summarize, I was doing whatever I wanted. Uh, there's no God. Um, I can do what I want, and that, that in the beginning we talked about freedom. There, there was a sense of freedom in that. Um, so suddenly, I I felt all the things that I was raised to be um, cautious about and and judge correctly and be prudent. Suddenly, anything went, and I dabbled in all sorts of things that I would be horrified if my my own children did today. Uh, and then my brother moved to to France, and I was visiting him in Paris. And during the visit, strolling around the city, I went into Saint Chapelle, um, and I was absolutely knocked out by the beauty of it. Absolutely bowled over. I really, really can't explain it. Uh, wasn't expecting it. Just going from one place to another, and um, I, I really did fall down <laughs> on my knees and just started sobbing. And the tears were streaming down my face, and I couldn't, I couldn't really understand why. Uh, and so I, I just put it to one side. But I would say that was the pebble in the shoe, 
there that slightly discombobulated me didn't, and made me feel uncomfortable with how I was living and how my life had become. I, I, my relationship with my dad had fallen apart. Mum was gone. Brother lived in another part of the world, and and I was slowly spiralling into uh, a, an empty a life of complete emptiness. Um, and so that beauty really hit me. And then one thing and another, soon after that, a, a job came up, um, whereupon I met uh, a few young Christians and one young Catholic man in particular who um, was really, really impressive. It was the first time I'd ever met, I think, a, a young Catholic who was absolutely on fire for his faith, absolutely loved his faith and knew it as well. Um, and he was married with a child, another on the way, and he spoke so beautifully about his wife and children. And it was so authentic, you know, it just, it really mm. showed in stark contrast the inauth inauthenticity of the people I had surrounded myself with, the things I was doing. When, when you're struck with that authenticity, it, it, um, it really, it really breaks you open, I think. Um, he was just a wonderful witness. And, and, and so I'd ask him questions. We worked together, so we'd spend lunch lunch times. And to his great credit, I sometimes think now if I, if I was presented with a me, I, I'd, be a, <laughs> I'd probably have a bit of a shorter fuse. But because I think back to some of the things I was saying, I was getting quite antagonistic with him. I remember saying, I'm never going to confession until they get rid of all the paedophiles in the church. And, you know, that, that mm. sort of stuff. And who does the church think it is? And, you know, because I knew everything, remember, because I... I uh, was so proud. It's pride, isn't it? I was so puffed up with pride, and sin has a has a tendency to do that to puff puff you up, uh, puff yourself up. So so there I was, and I knew everything. And, and he just very very slowly would uh, grapple with these questions, wrestle, you know, that wrestling, that Israel, and um, we wrestled with these questions in a really gentle way. And he'd direct me to first of all, I know this sounds quite surprising given my upbringing in the Catholic faith, but he said, read the Gospels. Just read them. You know, mm -hmm. Actually read the Gospels. Because, of course, you're absorbing Scripture through the lectionary in, in Mass, but I, I hadn't really ever sat and read the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And I did. And true enough, the Jesus I met in the Gospels was not the Jesus I think that I had a picture of in my, I think, in my, in my own head. And... um. The first thing it's <clears throat> the first thing it really did, I think, was start to puncture that pride, because I, a very small shrinking feeling came over me, um, uh, and I was embarrassed. I felt I felt ashamed, and that that was just really starting with the gospels. Uh, that's all. That's all it took. It was that, that encounter really with with Christ in the gospels, um, and so that slow kind of opening again. Then I would ask questions, and he would direct me to to um, you know, I, the Church Fathers, uh, Aquinas. Um, I started picking up and reading things that I would never have read, and I'd say, well, why can't this happen? He'd say, well, here, look at this. Theology of the Body, uh, mm -hmm. Miliaris Dignitatum. And I thought this, again, it was that same authenticity and truth. Well, it's truth, isn't it? That's what it is. Mm -hmm. it, when you're presented with truth, um, y there's no hiding from that. Th you just see it, um, and it breaks through. So... Uh, all of that sort of had shifted then, I would say, the head. So the head was on this journey, and I thought, actually, now all those answers are coming, and I can see that they're real, and I can see that they're true, and I can see that they're good and they're beautiful, but I was um, not in full communion with the church. And then I was, at the same time, this young man said, come come and pray the rosary in the chapel. It was an, in a school, and he'd got uh, this rosary group. And the funny thing is, I mean, actually... He left and it just, it just, it, it completely disbanded. Um, but for a while, there were 20 or 30 of the, probably the most difficult pupils who would trundle along. And the head teacher used to say, you'll never guess where I saw X. In the chapel. <laughs> in the chapel at lunchtime, praying the rosary. You know, you just wouldn't expect it. And and in there, they, they just sat silently and, and, and before the Blessed Sacrament, so at exposition. And... And and then we prayed the rosary, and there in the chapel before our blessed Lord, I then then that same experience of in San, in Saint Chapelle, it was like this cracking of the heart. So the head had shifted, the heart had cracked open, and then 
um, I was desperate to get back to communion. I was desperate to receive Jesus in communion, and and uh, so I had I went and made the first my first confession for thirty years. Was it? I don't know. Twenty? However many years? A long time, decades. Um, and that was a beautiful experience. That was a really beautiful experience because I think people are frightened of confession, um, and. I, they 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 have their reasons and I and I had mine, but I would say now we go to confession regularly. My children go to confession regularly. We have fantastic priests, and it's such a gift. It's such a gift. I don't know where I'd be without it. And that was that was really really wonderful. And then I all I wanted to do was shout it from the rooftops. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's all. And and so you say, how did you get from there to here? Why am I podcasting and writing? I write for the Catholic Herald because because it's like you find this gift. This gift is Jesus, and and you just you just want everybody. You want to run around saying, "Look, you, this is what this is what you need." I've been where you are. You know, I've mm. been in the gutter, <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is the answer. Um, so that's that's why I'm here. Beautiful. Um, so a few things there I'd like to sort of pick up on um, the sort of the experience of of beauty, and this is a this is a big part of uh, sort of Bishop. Robert Barron's um what he calls like the the way of beauty and I don't know if you've seen his sort of word on fire bibles that they've they've produced now um they they're ab- they're absolutely stunning they're really really beautiful and this mm-hmm. idea that that people can debate about is there such a thing as 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 truth um mm-hmm. I think we've moved on slightly from here now, but like at the time when he first started speaking about it the idea of moral relativism as well is there such a thing as the good um, I think now we're, we're a lot less relativistic than than we than we were. Um, I think people have a sense that there are certain things which are which are very wrong. Um, unfortunately, they largely tend to be sort of Catholic teaching about the the human person mm. um, now. But our society definitely has a very strong streak of there are certain things that that just are wrong, um, and then cause them phobias. Uh, but this sort of beauty we can't quite shut ourselves off from because it it affects us at a at a different level and yet i i have this little worry and i'd be i'd be interested what you'd have to say as a as a parent about this that now so often our our experience of of beauty particularly the fact that we always have almost everyone has a camera on them the the whole point now Our, our phones use less and less to speak um, and more and more to uh, take photographs um, and then to display those photographs to others that we see beauty in our immediate reaction is as opposed to, to to take it in to be transformed by it we seek to capture it in order that it can become part of the the performance of mm. life of showing others how beautiful how great my <clears throat> my life is and and then that relates a, a little to me what you said about confession and, and part of the beauty of confession is it it's one of those few arenas in in life where the, the mask can genuinely mm. come off. So much of of modern modern life is is performative, mm. um, and as a you know as a you know, definitely a mi- middle aged person now, I still speak about the online world. But for younger people, that that distinction doesn't really exist. It's just it's just part of part of part of the life. And actually, I think increasingly the the sort of what I would regard as real life, well, real life becomes for the sake of the performative life, um, which is where where I'm actually seen, and uh, and and where I'm affirmed. And we ha- we mm. have this desire, this desire to be seen. Like people speak all the time about, I felt truly seen, um, mm. but where they get seen is on online, and where they get affirmed, where they get loved, where they get likes is mm. is online and i wonder what what's your experience with your with your children uh, around beauty and how do you sort of protect them from this urge to to capture it and allow them to be transformed by it <laughs> well first of all our, our kids don't have phones um i do i'm guilty um but they don't uh the the younger ones at least uh, my older stepchildren do but um the so i think what's interesting is it's true and i do it myself i'll go somewhere beautiful sunset and I'll take pictures and the thing is we're always disappointed by it mm. so it we can't capture it and I think we know that so we try to capture it we look at photographs and say oh no but it was much better you had to be there and that's exactly right you had to be there 
you have to see that beauty and we we i think we'll never so yes i think there is a, a bit of a mask brought about by by the the artificial world and it is it is a worry but beauty true beauty will always um be something that we we can recognize um at least we have to give our children experiences of that um so that they can recognize it and not be sort of sh hidden from it um so so i'm a big believer that that I, I i think they don't need phones they don't need to use the computers as much i've i'm a irritant to the head teacher of my kids schools because they say the kids need laptops and i say no they don't <laughs> <laughs> they say you need to get them a laptop I say, i'm not getting them a laptop they've got a book and they've got a pen <laughs> so um <clears throat> but uh so i i think what we well as parents do is is just try to keep them as much in the real you know it's interesting isn't it because um we had lockdown during the covid years and my kids really poignantly said at the end of it when everything was getting back to normal this has been the happiest time of my life happiest time of our lives and dad was off work i wasn't so busy we were doing jigsaw puzzles you know everyone must have done about 10 million jigsaws mm -hmm. and uh we played in the garden we did fancy dress we had talent shows we did quiz nights and we were just talking and eating and laughing together and that's beautiful because it's 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 that relationship that you talked about at the beginning and when we've lost that community because everyone's in networks and although although you said about um this happiness uh, it's not true happiness but that, that people think that they'll find this happiness in in these in this artificial world uh the, the evidence shows that they don't because you know we have the highest rates of suicide and depression in the west uh it's growing especially amongst young girls jonathan Haidt, who spoke at a conference i was at in october said he's just he's just done some research and, and the statistics are terrible and what was interesting is it, they're they're worse for teenage girls than for boys but they're bad for boys and they're worse yet for teenage girls who have no religious faith mm. So they have no community, they have no ritual, they have no outlet for, um, you know. So what's beautiful about our faith is it's sacramental. So it's it's the invisible uh, and then made visible. So there's that real, you really participate in, in a real way. Um, it, there's nothing artificial about it. It's the very mm. opposite. It's, it's, the, it's the way that perfectly aligns the human person as, a, as an image of uh, the divine. Um, and you said we might talk about femininity. I think, I think this is key in, in a way, is that I think we've lost sight of, we don't see because we're, we're so horizontal, you know, this enlightenment myth that we can progress through human power alone. And um, we've lost sight of the fact that there are two pillars that hold up the world, the visible and the invisible. And I think woman <clears throat> really... Um, is she, her identity as woman, the feminine, is to is to hold up, to give integrity to the visible. And I think what what women have done and what feminism has done, um, which is devastating, is to turn women to extremes, either into men or into objects abused by men. Mm. And. Um, so we totally ignore the fact that there's anything, there's any invisible kind of pillar holding the world and it's all just what you can see. So that goes to your point about everything is, you know, this artificial screen. Because that's all we need. There's nothing, you can see it, it's on a screen, it's it's technology, it's this this artificiality that we've created. But it's not real. The reality this is something that we can't see. So... There's a lovely quote. Can I just read you this? Because I think it's wonderful from Gertrude von Lefort, who um, wrote The Eternal Woman. And she says, man exercises his historically effective talents publicly and in that performance spends his strength. Woman is also the carrier of historically effective talents. And while her endowment is equal to that of a man, she expends it not for herself, but for the next generation. In this surrendering power, lies the font of reverence for God and the appropriate humility of creature as creature. And I think this end point where we, we 
apart from God, if we see ourselves apart from God, it necessarily eradicates woman um, because it's a horizontal worldview that doesn't recognise that, that invisible. So woman as surrender, and that's seen exemplified in Mary. So Mary who says, be it done unto me according to your word, your will be done. Um, and it, it requires a much longer um, discussion than the one we can have today because, of course, then people say, well, can't a woman be a doctor or a lawyer? Or That's not really the point. You, woman will can be and is all of those things, but as woman. So if she tries to be those things as man, uh, as masculine, then that's where it's problematic. So, yeah. That's a, a an astonishing um, line there, or two words put together, surrendering power. Mm. Um, I don't think that they're, they're words that, that somebody, unless they were sort of inspired by the, by the Holy Spirit, um, with a real insight into reality would would put together because they they don't go together in um in in in, in modern thought um you, know, you, you can imagine actually to a to a japanese um person you know around the time of the second world war i don't know where japanese culture would be at with regards to that idea but power in surrendering power no it's sort of completely undignified to to surrender in any way to any any force outside us and and yet the the model of of the church is 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 feminine mm, you know we yeah. refer to the the church as as she and and there is a, a surrender in that to to the will of god which which actually then i start to realize um the will of god should be my will because he's created me in in his image and likeness and desires the the best for me but that idea of a power in, in surrendering it. And then we, we see that in, in Christ on the cross. Mm. There's a surrendering power of, of Christ on the cross. And a, a, a wonderful homily I was listening to a, a, a while ago by a friend of mine, Father, Father Barry, and he spoke about the virtue of meekness. Mm. And meekness, um, to me, in a cultural way, sounded like something that, oh, don't be so meek. Um, you know, meek, meek would be more likely to be a, to be a vice where we'd encourage, you know, the the little girl who was meek. Well, you need to speak up and assert yourself. Yeah. But he said, meekness, as it's generally been been understood, is is the is the ability to to have self self possession in a time of stress, self possession in in a time of uh, attack, and and not to immediately lash out. Um, mm. But to be able to to be able to endure and to be able to choose what to do in the moment, not to not to simply not to simply respond. Um, and so, yeah, that, I've got uh, I've got the book, The Eternal Woman, but I haven't oh, but I haven't fantastic. read it yet. You've got um, to read it. It's and now, very good. surrendering <laughs> surrendering power is 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 going to bump it to the to the top of the piles. Yeah. Um, well, if you think about it, it's the only power we really have in a very real way. It's the only mm. power we have is to, is to surrender to God. That's that's nothing else, um, and we have that. That's our will, our will to surrender to His will, who loves us, who is love itself. And if we can trust in that and surrender to that, then of course that that happiness you spoke about and the happiness Christ speaks about in the Sermon on the Mount, it's so antithetical to everything that we've been told. The world, the lies of the world, that this will make you happy. Um, it's like Chesterton's: we're born standing on our head. We we need to we need only we need to turn rightwards to see so mm. so that uh, all those things to to power you know Christ says blessed are the meek and um, to our thirst for lust you know blessed are the pure of heart and so our, our th those things that that we believe will bring us happiness don't and in a way it's we say well he must be wrong because you know, <laughs> surely you know sex drugs rock and roll and money will bring you happiness. But then you think that's where we surrender our will to his. We say, well, okay, he might know something we don't. He is God after all. So, mm. so I'm going to take it. I might not understand it now, but then in the doing of it, it starts to become clear. So it's that, that leap of faith to say, uh, let's listen to our creator. Let's surrender to our creator and give him the benefit of the doubt that he probably does know better than we do. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. One of the... Uh things about wearing a, a a habit is the conversations that you get into in in public and um sometimes when you're traveling on 
on, on the train, you see somebody looking at you and you, you know that they're going to speak to you. They're trying to sort of get over their English reserve, um, which if you were in a collar, they could just about deal with because they'd know what you were. But you're in this weird outfit and they need to know what, what you are. Um, and there's the odd person when you tell them, you know, they start the conversation and then you tell them a, a little bit about your, about your life that um when you mention the the vows of sort of poverty chastity and, and and obedience um there are some people who just think well you're going to be very sad um but there are other people um who actually find you quite threatening um they they sort of in a really quite forceful way try and talk you out of what you're doing because in a sense since you're a threat to their entire world view and the and the received wisdom that these are the things that you must claim for yourself that you must go after and, and acquire if, if you're if you're to be happy um and uh, and here i am sort of you know smiling and not faking it most of the time and uh, <laughs> and, that, and that's a that's a that's a threat to 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 people um to pick up the, again a bit more on this uh sur sur surrendering power though and and femininity because mm. one of the the things um about the the christian the christian life is and i think as you said earlier when we were talking about reading the gospels in their entirety and you realize that this is not the prosperity gospel what we're being promised is not sort of a, a lifetime of of cuddles with jesus and it's all going to be it's all going to be fine um it will ultimately be fine but it is going to be it is going to be tough and I think women, by their by their physiology, have to endure suffering as a as a basic fact of of of, of their life, and uh, and of the, the sort of woman's most incredible ability biologically to be able to 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 receive new life and and to gestate it and then to bring it in into into the, into the world Invo involves involves real real suffering, and then the process of raising. A child who is utterly dependent upon you and to do your job well as a mother to enable that child to be independent of you having been completely and utterly dependent on you that all of these things because of a woman's f physiology means that that suffering is sort of forced forced upon her in a way that men actually particularly in the in the modern world where very few of us have to do man manual work um we can we can dodge suffering if if we want to and that's one of the reasons why i think sort of women have a, a greater sort of religious 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 sense um and that there is as as you say in this um holding out actually of the ideal model of the human person as being male that the the second and third and fourth waves of of feminism um, seem to hold out something very, very beautiful and powerful get, gets lost. Yeah, I think um, I think that's true. There's a quote, isn't there? Why, why are the prisons full of men? Because the churches are full of women. Um, I I I think men suffer differently, um, and I think one of the ways in which men suffer at the moment is that they are having their natural um, masculinity stripped away from them. Their their desire to protect women and children they're told that it's toxic and they should be ashamed of it and man doesn't know how to be man young man doesn't know what it means to be a man um, and that's suffering that's tough um, and women yes I think that's that's probably true um, I want to say that um, being a mother is the greatest gift and the most beautiful thing it's just something that we're not telling our young women enough mm. um it's so it's so beautiful there is nothing can compare uh and i know that in schools there's a lot of moves to get women into stem and to right the putative injustices of the patriarchy um but even not instead of but as well as i think we should do more to say that's great but so is the vocation of being a wife and being a mother um that's beautiful and in fact i gave a talk to a group of 17 year olds a few years ago and um, they had different people coming in and i spoke about my vocation as a mother a wife and mother and a few of them came up to me afterwards which i thought was a terrible um um sort of indictment on the 
the way in which where we've got to. And in, in whispered tones in the corner, looking both ways, they said, Miss, can we just say, we really loved what you said and we really want to get married and have children, but we don't feel we can say that. Mm. Um, and they had to be quiet about it. They were afraid, they were genuinely afraid to admit that that's what they wanted. And then they'd go into the bigger public group and talk about becoming a doctor and a lawyer and, mm. and a CEO and because the world needs more CEOs. Um, so, yes, su- the thing about suffering is y- you're going to suffer. So I'd, I don't know if who said it, but you can either suffer with Christ or without him. <laughs> mm. You know, there's your choice. It's, it's not this, uh, as you said, cuddles with Jesus. Um, he walks with us in, in, in our pain. He understands pain. My goodness. My goodness, does he understand pain? Doesn't Our Lady understand pain and suffering? Mm. Um, but they carry us. Um, he, he didn't come to take it away. And this is something that goes back to the beginning when we talked about my mum. Um, when she was very ill and had cancer, she had cancer, multiple tumours in her brain and liver and all around, and she, she was really, I mean, really suffering. Uh, and she used to say, uh, she used to, she prayed right until the end until she couldn't speak and then we prayed around her and uh, she said, I offer it up. And I didn't fully understand what she meant. Um, she kept saying, I offer it up to you, God. And that actually made me more angry. I thought, what's she doing? Mm. What is she doing? She's dying. And I'm going, at that point, I hadn't completely lost my faith. And I was saying, God, heal her. You know, come, come down, heal her. Let there be a miracle and she'll get up and walk away and everything will be fine. And it didn't happen. And I thought, I thought you meant to be God, you know. Why didn't you heal her? I asked you to. Mm. And all the time, even though it wasn't me that was the one in with the cancer suffering, she w- she wasn't praying. I don't remember her once praying, God heal me. Mm. All she did was say, give me the strength and I offer it up. And it's only later, um, as you've heard my journey, that I've come back to the faith, which I really think is miraculous, and all the, all the small God incidences that brought me back mm. to the faith were in, very, in a very real way, uh, a result of her offering that, saying, "I'm suffering anyway, but I'm going to, I'm going to give it to the cross. I want you to take it uh, and and redeem it, the way that you died on the cross and rose in glory. I want you to take this suffering that I have to experience anyway. I want you to take it to the cross, and I want you to redeem it. And that redemption, that redemptive suffering, you know, is is so, is so real. You know, it really, that's a real, it's a reality. We talked about artificiality and reality." That's that's something that is just that just happens if we it's that surrender again. If we can say to God, here, just here, we might not be able to say anything more than that. Jesus, here, take it. Then He transforms it. You know, see, I make all things new, and He does. And so and so, thanks to my mother's prayers, and she's probably doing far more for me there than she could have done here. Um, I, you know, I've, I've my life is transformed, transformed in Christ. So. Yeah, we suffer, but but it says Gertrude von der Fort said, it's it's that that lost inability to accept that we need to surrender, and that we expend, you know, all our efforts for others. So that you know that you talked about femininity. This is another thing people struggle to understand. We are all feminine before Christ. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, because it's it's what does feminine mean symbolically. And this is a conversation that needs to be got into where people can see we talk about female as uh, the physical embodiment of the feminine, but it's not it's not quite the same. So we are all feminine before Christ, who is masculine. So we receive from Christ. We receive from God. We receive creation. We receive our lives and uh, he gives. And in the same way, then that that male body and the female body complementary, the male gives and the woman receives. And that's life giving. That's that's fertile it's not sterile um but only when we're rightly ordered when we are able to receive from god who gives so yeah <laughs> yeah that's incredibly beautiful i wish i wish we had um more more time um but i'll have to beg you after the after the program to get you get you back on and uh, and get you inundated with messages from our listeners telling us how much they've enjoyed it and how you must come back there was a, a line that um just struck me with everything that you said by uh, Simone Weil, who said that the extreme greatness of Christianity lies not in the fact that it proposes a supernatural remedy for suffering, but a supernatural use for it. Mm. Um, and only yeah. when we come to understand sort of redemptive 
suffering and what Christ does for us and what he, he invites us to join him in, in, in doing. Um, do we begin to sort of comprehend and be, be transformed by those, those acts of faith that your, that your mother showed and, and then be capable of replicating them in our own lives? So yeah. I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to, to join us. It's been a, a real pleasure to, to have you on the, on the program and I, I hope to welcome you again soon. Thank you, Father Toby. It's been wonderful to be here. I'd love to come back. Great. God bless you. And let's just finish by um, praying for for Catherine and uh, all all her work as a as a journalist. And we entrust her to our to our blessed mother to to console her in the trials and to keep her strong in her faith with Christ. And so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you.